Church, how are you? Wow. You look amazing. Do I say that every time that I get up here? I'm not sure, but you never cease to amaze me. You guys look great so early on a Sunday. Hey, have you uh, been tuning in throughout the series that we've been in? Yeah, Crossroads? Um, what did you guys think about Pastor Ron last week? He's good, huh? Isn't it great to have spirit-filled overseers at a church, yeah? Um, and I've got news for you. Actually, today is a practice run at our new South location. Yeah. So if you're, if you're looking for Pastor Tracy, she has disappeared. She has left the building. She is at the South location. I think they have a picture of her and Joe. That's from like really early this morning because they got up really early to test out what it's like to set up, tear down, or load in and load out in a new facility, because that's what that facility will be. Uh, So in like two weeks, on the 19th, we're launching that location. Why? Why is because we need churches to be as close to our houses as possible so that we can be a part of the body of Christ. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. And we're running out of seats at this location. So that, that's going to be helpful for us. But uh, So we're in this series called Crossroads, and this series has been about uh, the spirit of wisdom, which turns out the spirit of wisdom is one person, the Holy Spirit, yeah? And we've, we've been learning how to work with the Holy Spirit throughout this 21 days of prayer, have we not? And I mean, 21 days of prayer, I don't know, if you haven't tuned into it, you can probably still tune into previous 21 days of prayer, it was, I got to tell you, life-changing. Like we're still getting testimonies from 21 days of prayer. And I think that they're just going to continue because the body of Christ was enlightened during that time, I believe. And and it always happens, but it's it's great because it always happens kind of in a different way in 21 days of prayer. We do it in August, we do it in January, and we always have something new to talk about in 21 days of prayer. So Today, we're going we're gonna to continue actually like ending our series called Crossroads. But today, we're going to talk about a topic that we're definitely going to need the spirit of wisdom for, all right? We're going to definitely need the Holy Spirit to drop into the room, okay? So let's, let's do this declaration together, and then I'll tell you what we're going to talk about today. Would you repeat this after me? Yeah. Would you seriously repeat this after me? Yeah. Okay, good. Today, yeah. I will hear the voice of God. Through the word of God, the word of God. My, eyes will be my eyes will be enlightened, and I will be changed. And I will be changed. Now look at somebody, let them know they will be changed. They said it, you're, they said it. You're just verifying what they said, that's all. Hey, have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed as you were growing up, there were things that you thought were true, that people told you were true, and then you found out that they weren't? Yeah, when you were growing up, things like, um, you remember the one where we used to believe that blood was blue until it left the body? Anybody? Was that a thing or was that just me? Some guy in the back's like, honey, is that true? It's not? Like, like that was one, right? Um, What was another? Uh, Twinkies. Twinkies last forever. Uh, They don't. They don't last forever. Like all of us heard the story of a 20-year Twinkie. It's not true. It's not. You, you thought it was. Again, the guy in the back's like, I'm taking notes. He's taking notes already on this stuff. Like, I'm blowing his mind already in the back. Twinkies don't last forever. Actually, the shelf life of a Twinkie, I had to look it up for you guys. It's like 45 days, actually. That's it. That's all it's got. And um, what about your mom? Your mom used to always tell you, stop staring into the microwave. You're going to get cancer. Yes. It's not true. It's not true. You can't get cancer from a microwave. <laughs> your mom just wanted you out of the kitchen. And you believed it for this long, yeah? Um, And then there's another one. Like, I thought that I used a a really big percentage of my brain. Um, But come to find out, we all just use like 10% of our brain. Have you ever heard this? So I'm sad to say, but Tracy's been right all along about me, (laughs) that I really don't use the full capacity of my brain most of the time. So uh, these things, but I think, you know, why I'm bringing these up is because sometimes we believe things that, that aren't true, but they're just like normal things that everyone thinks are true, but they're not. And it happens in the church as well. And what I call them is traditions, things that come along with the church for so long that we believe, but it ends up, a lot of them aren't true. 
There, there's some that just aren't true. So sometimes we're believing tradition rather than the Bible, and we don't even know it, you know? So today we're, we're going to talk about a topic, and this topic uh, might catch you by surprise, but this topic is going to be women in ministry. Women in ministry. Can I get a bigger amen from the women in the place? <laughs> Now, it's, it's not just a message for women because it's going to be for everybody because what the enemy tries to do is marginalize people. And what we're going to do today is expose something that he's not going to marginalize anymore. Amen? So we're going to just kind of do that together. We're going to get into some scriptures that, have, that are challenging to even read, challenging to figure out. And that's why I said we're going to need the Holy Spirit to help us a lot today in the message. So you could help me by just amening stuff, even if you don't agree with it. Just like amen and stuff, like bringing some energy to this thing today. Because there's probably like three different types of people in the room. There's, there's the, the person that's like, oh, no, 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 no. That's not scriptural. Women cannot lead in ministry. It's just not going to happen. Um, and they're fine today because I'm on the stage. But next week, they're going to be like, wait, what? What just happened? Because <laughs> Tracy's going to be back on the stage. <laughs> but so there's those folks. And I want to say, welcome to Grow Church. We're going to learn together today. Um, the, the second one is this. Uh, there's people that are like, you know, like, I've been led in business, in church, everywhere by women, and it's no big deal. So there's those people. And then there's people that are sitting in here going like, is this really a whole topic? Like, why are we talking about it? Like, who would ever <laughs> talk about Why is that a thing? You know, um, and I, I kind of just want to, I want to take this whole topic and meet every single one of those people that could be listening to this uh, right where you're at. And, and I, I really want to get to the topic of uh, almost like more of marginalization, how, how the enemy tries to marginalize people in general, but we're just going to use the topic of women in ministry to do that. Okay. Um, so, and, and it's kind of a bigger topic than what I thought. Now, in 2021, the year that we're in right now, okay, there was a denominational, a made, one of the major Christian denominations that had their annual convention where they reaffirm their rule book and stuff like that. And they, they went through this, and I, I read quite a few of the articles on this denomination's, you know, convention that they had, and they were talking about the rules. And number one, it didn't catch me by surprise. I think it should be everybody's rule in every denomination. We just happen to be non-denominational, but I would jump on number one with them. It was, Jesus is the only way to heaven. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm in. Number one, I'm good, right? Like, number one for me too. So we're, we're good there. Number two, I could still get on board with, it was um, that... Marriage is between one man and one woman. And if you look in the scripture, that, that's what you're going to find. So I'm like, I'm good with number two, you know. But then number three came along, and I was like, I, it caught me by surprise. Because I'm thinking number three is going to be along the lines of one of those really hot topics like pro-life or pro-choice or like gender, like God creates gender, people don't, or something like that, you know? Uh, I thought that that was going to land at number three, but number three was women cannot lead churches. And I was like, whoa, that's a big topic. That landed at number three. Wow, we should look at this. And like, I've looked at it and, and I've read the scriptures on it, but I think the body of Christ is confused. So what we're going to do today is try, kind of going to try to bring some of the confusion out of it. Because what I would really like to do, our goal, maybe our goal can just be this. Our goal is to believe what God says more than what tradition says. Can we do that? Like if we, if we just go from that angle today, maybe we'll get somewhere. And it, it could be challenging, maybe, maybe not. Because um, there's some scriptures that we're going to have to really get down quite deep in today to understand them completely. Because actually traditions have been written on a few of the scriptures that we're going to look at today. So it, it could be challenging, but I, I have a feeling the Holy Spirit's going to show up and help me with this. Yeah? So like um, it, today our crossroad is believing tradition or believing God. Now I love it when tradition agrees with God, but sometimes when it doesn't, you have a crossroad. You have a crossroad in front of you that you've got to decipher. So I'm not, I, I, I've titled this message, I'm not listening. I'm not listening. Now, would you turn to your neighbor and just say, I'm not listening? <laughs> now, I did that on purpose because you've been wanting to tell that person next to you all morning, I'm not listening. But it's not that. It's I'm not listening to tradition if it doesn't line up with the heart of Jesus. Okay? I'm not listening to tradition 
if it doesn't line up with the heart of Jesus. Because, and maybe here's where we can start the, the framework is, is this. If you ever see anyone being marginalized, it's not the heart of Jesus. It is what it is. If you find anyone being marginalized, it's not the heart of Jesus. So if we can just start there. Now, marginalization, what does that mean? Well, then it, it means to be treated as insignificant or peripheral. Like to all the gifts that God put inside of you to be treated like secondary or like it's not a big deal. That would not be the heart of Jesus because Jesus has a calling on every single one of us and he wants to maximize that calling in us. Is that true? So what, what we're looking at is you, you shouldn't be able to marginalize what Jesus maximized. Like if you're going to try and marginalize what Jesus maximized, if we get a hold of the scriptures, you're going to lose because the scriptures maximize the gifts in people. Is that a good, is that, can I get a better amen on that? Come on, wake up a little bit this morning. Let's go. So like, just, just look at somebody again and just tell them I'm not listening, not listening, but now listen, we're going to go into Mark seven. See what I did there? I'm not listening, but listen. Uh, so Mark 7 says this, well, did Isaiah prophesy of, the, of, the, of you hypocrites? And this is a little bit strange writing because it would be Isaiah the prophet prophesied well, okay? He did a little Yoda thing on us there, I'm not sure. So well, did Isaiah prophesy of the hypocrites as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain, they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And it continues, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, all too well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Huh? So there was a problem and Jesus gives us a warning. Because this is Jesus, I really like this because Jesus is actually quoting Old Testament in the New Testament. So it's actually always been the heart of God to uh, not just traditionalize things, but to hear from God himself. So actually this topic today has been the heart of God since the beginning, like way back in the Old Testament, when things looked quite a bit different, this topic was still the same. That's why I like how Jesus uh, brings Isaiah into the mix. But the warning is this, the tradition of men has become more important than the heart of God. And if that's the case, we, we, can, we can just stop in our tracks, we can repent from it, and we can move forward. Because that's the same with any kind of any issues, right? Jesus is always ready for us to turn and go a different direction. So today, maybe we can do that. And Colossians 2.8 is another one that helps us understand this. And now he's saying the warning is beware. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. Now he's comparing traditions of men to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. So there's a difference sometimes. There's a difference from what we bring along in our history from what the heart of Jesus is in, in a situation. Would you agree? So tradition, tradition can sometimes just be, can, can be just longstanding opinion if we're not careful. Longstanding opinion may not be the gospel. So we have to be careful that we're not just landing in longstanding opinion, somebody else's opinion rather than the word of God. The word of God is our foundation as a church. The church, the big C church, like the word of God is our foundation. What if, what if we've been standing on foundation that wasn't the word of God? That's, that would be a dangerous place. That's why Jesus is warning us like this. So I think it puts the whole conversation to end, really it should, but it doesn't, this verse in Galatians that I'm gonna show you. This should, this should just settle it all. This should be it. We're done. It doesn't, but it should. Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Now that's complicated right here, especially here in the Bible, Back then, Jews and Greeks, they wouldn't even be on the same street. They wouldn't be anywhere near each other. That's like saying, hey, you Jew and you Greek, you're all equal. And they'd be like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm a Jew. I'm, I'm the lineage of Jesus. Like, I'm, I'm really the same as a Greek? But then it continues, and, and it, it even may get worse for some folks. There is neither slave nor free. What? 
There is neither male nor female. What? For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Should that not just be the mic drop moment right there of the New Testament? Like, done. It's over. But it gets more complicated because we can't just stop here. We got to understand the whole canon of scripture. And there are some scriptures that we're going to get to today that complicate this a little bit. So we're going to try and dig into them. But what is he, what is he saying? He's saying we are one in Christ equal, but not the same. You can be equal, but not the same. I, I like our differences, but we're equal in Jesus sight. Is that true? So like, we're not the same, but we're equal. That's what he's saying here. So the teachings of Jesus, he, he never differentiates or he doesn't make distinctions between men and women in his teaching. I don't know if you recognize that. But so Jesus preaches to all of us as one in him. But then we get the apostle Paul and he complicates matters a little bit. <laughs> Why does the apostle Paul complicate matters a little bit? Because Paul is writing to the local church. So when he writes to the local church, there's context there. There's local church in Corinth, which is the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. So he's writing to a local church. Now we would say today he's writing to us as the local church, but there are cultures within the, the Corinthian church that need to be addressed specifically for that time, for that place, for that local church. Then he writes the book of Ephesians. It's to the church in Ephesus. He writes to his little buddy, Timmy, Timothy. He's a leader in the church in Ephesus. So he's writing specifically to Timothy in 1st and 2nd Timothy to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians, he's writing specifically to the church in Ephesus. So we can take from it, but we have to also understand there's something to it that he's writing to the local church. Is that fair? So I want to frame that out well enough because as we start pulling apart some of Paul's writings, we're going to have to understand that to get the most out of it. So Paul, he, he writes, Paul writes some absolute truth and some situational instruction. So absolute truth would be, here's the way it is for everyone all the time. That's it. But then there's some situational instruction that the apostle Paul would say for the church in Corinth that are going through this one issue here's your guideline. For, for the issue in Ephesus, for Timothy, the leader in Ephesus, here's your guideline, okay? So that would be situational instruction. So we have to decipher that as we read from the apostle Paul. So I'm gonna start with 1 Corinthians 11, and it's gonna help us with the next verse that we go to, 1 Corinthians 14. Are we doing okay so far? All right, 1 Corinthians 11. Paul writes this. Now this is to the church in Corinth, and he writes, but every woman who prays and prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. Now this whole part of it here, I'm not really focusing on, because <laughs> this is all culture of the day kind of stuff, the this, this second couple of lines here. But in the first line, we're gonna have to understand what, what the Apostle Paul is saying to help us with 1 Corinthians 14. So he's saying, but every woman who prays and prophesies, stop. Every woman who prays and prophesies would mean that women can pray and prophesy aloud in the church. That's what it would mean. Because if, if you're prophesying, you have to prophesy to somebody else. Is that true? It would kind of be void if you just did all your prophesying by yourself in a room. Would it not? It would kind of nullify the point. So he's saying something here that we have to understand so that we can get into 1 Corinthians 14, which is a very complicated scripture, which tradition and doctrine were written on in the church. Let's go to it. 1 Corinthians 14, it says, women should remain silent in the churches. And all the women said, <laughs> I thought I was going to get a better amen than that. We're going to get there. Don't start throwing stuff yet. Come on, relax, relax. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. Hmm. Did you really need to bring that one to Sunday morning? It's in the Bible. Shouldn't we understand it? Well, if it's in the Bible, we got to understand it right? Now, doctrine was written on this without drilling down on it very far, without understanding it to its fullest capacity. Doctrine has been written on that. 
I would suggest that we shouldn't go so fast as to write doctrine on it. We should understand, is this absolute truth or is it situational instruction? Okay, so if this were absolute truth, then the Apostle Paul three chapters before in chapter 11 would be lying to you. So one is true or the other's true, not both. So it can't be an absolute truth. Are you, are you following me so far? So it's not an absolute truth. So then it needs to be situational instruction. Okay, so how is this situational instruction? Well, let's get a little context here, okay? Back in this day, women were uneducated. They were not allowed to have an education like the men. True? That, that's true back in the day. It is not the same anymore. Thank God, right? But back in the day, that was the case. So they were in, in an auditorium or in a sanctuary in the synagogue. They were separated. Men on one side, the knowledgeable ones, and women on the other side, the unknowledgeable ones. And there was a problem. There was a problem because they were hollering across the aisle to the other section of the church, which were the knowledgeable ones or the men. But we, we get confused here because that scripture showed us a word, women, which I think was translated incorrectly. I think the actual translation there in the Greek takes us back to wife rather than women. If it takes us to wife and you're separated and the auditorium, think about it, has, a, has an aisle down the middle and women are on one side and men are on the other. And now we reference wives on the one side and the wife's like, hey, honey, he just, that was a good point. Um, what exactly does that mean? You see, it takes a whole different context to that scripture. Let me read it for you in the message translation. It'll, it'll help us. And usually the message translation is not the one that you go to for better understanding. It's a simpler version in, in like today's context. But this one gets it right because look how it starts. Instead of women, it starts with wives. That is the correct translation of that word from the Greek, wives. If you look back through your Strong's Concordance, you're going to find that. Wives must not disrupt worship talking when they should be listening, asking questions that could more appropriately be asked of their husbands at home. God's book of the law guides our manners and customs here. Wives have no license to use the time of worship for unwarranted speaking. It puts a whole new context to something that doctrine was written on. It's talking to a husband and a wife and the husband just happens to be at that time the educated one to help his wife come along with and understand. So this is actually bridging the gap between the educated and the uneducated and trying to educate the uneducated. People have used this scripture to, to marginalize a group of people when it was actually meant to elevate a group of people. Whoa. But doctrines were written on this stuff. Can you see where I'm coming from? So there's a, dis a distinction, however, in scripture between a wife and a female leader. There is. There's a distinction between a wife and a female leader. And I'm interested here because I think there is in the church, if you look at Ephesians 5, and I'm not going to go to it today, but if you look at Ephesians 5, it talks about a husband's role and a wife's role. And you'll hear it at every wedding that you go to. And they're different, okay? So there's a gender-specific role within the house, but then in the church, it seems like he's leaning more towards a gift orientation than a gender orientation. Are you, are you following me here? So it's not a guideline for gender in the church. It's a guideline for gifts in the church. See where I'm going? So in, in the home, there are gender guidelines, but in the church, there are gifts to elevate. There's a difference. That's what it seems like we're, we're going to here but doctrine has been written all over this stuff. So if this is situational instruction, then I wonder the next complicated scripture, maybe we can go to that with the same eyes and see what the apostle Paul is trying to say in this. Can we do that? So this one is 1 Corinthians 2, 11 through 12. Let the woman, and we're gonna go back to that the woman part of it there because there's a tense change in this whole section of scripture that we're gonna uh, investigate for a second. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Very similar scripture to before, a little bit different uh, alignment here in the scripture because we'll, let's go back to the context of it, okay? If you take 
uh, 1 Timothy 2.11, but backtrack a little bit. You're going to find 1 Timothy 2.8, and that's talking to the men. That's saying, hey, men, listen, in different translations, it'll say something about wrath or anger because men were consistently angry people back in the day. So he's saying, hey, check your anger, check your wrath at the door before you come into the church. Okay, guys? Then it goes on to verse nine. And what it says in verse nine is women. So it talks to all women. And it starts talking about a dress code. Well, then, okay, if, if there's a dress code to talk about, let's, let's hold up on that just for a second because we have to understand the context of Ephesus. Now, I've been to Ephesus. It's crazy. There's a synagogue and there's a brothel right across the street. Like Ephesus is messed up at this time. Well, even today, because nobody lives there anymore because it's all broken down. But back in the day when people were living there, it was crazy in Ephesus. Like women were mistreated like to a whole nother level in Ephesus. They worshiped a God named Diana and at the statue's feet, women were mistreated right there. Throughout the whole city, they were mistreated. So what, what's the apostle Paul doing? He's saying, okay, guys, you're mean, stop it. Women, let's get you equal but to get you equal, we're going to have to cover you up a little bit. So like, let's all go into the auditorium. Let's all go into the sanctuary. Let's all go into the temple, whatever word you want to use. Let's all go into the synagogue and let's all be equal. That's what he started. This, this is the context of where we're at here. Then it switches tense and it goes to the woman. Now he's writing to Timothy, who's the leader in the church of Ephesus. Are you following me so far? If you look back at 1 Timothy chapter 1, he addresses three gentlemen, which I can't even say their names, so I'm not going to try to. He addresses three gentlemen who are out of line in the church. And what did he, what's he say to these three men? He says, I handed them over to Satan. I'm like, easy, Paul. <laughs> like, he has, he has absolutely a short fuse with men in the church because they're already educated. So when they're doing something against the rules of the church, they know it. Okay, so then we go from women, you should dress this way. Men, stop your wrath, check it at the door. And then he goes to the woman. So maybe in this context, maybe Timothy has already asked him a question. And Timothy's like, hey, uh, I, I've, got, I've got a challenging lady in the church. <laughs> she's kind of like loud and boisterous. And she's taken like, she's taken a lot of the energy out of the room. What, what do I do? And he says, well, the woman, here's, here's what you do. Here's what you tell her to do. He doesn't say, give her to Satan, like he does with the dudes. He says, hey, have her sit in silence and learn. So I'm thinking like the scripture here in 1 Timothy, that doctrine was written on, that people were uh, pushed down in society because of, was actually intended to build them up once again. So he doesn't say like you're doing it intentionally. He's saying you're doing it because you don't know. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna just push you out. What I'm gonna do is build you up. So sit back, learn. I think maybe this is what he's saying. He, he's saying, and he's probably saying it to, to all of us, but at that time he, he had a short wick with men <laughs> because in the church they already knew or they were already supposed to have known. Listen, learn, and lead when ready. I think that's the point of 1 Timothy 2 here. Listen, learn, and lead when ready. I don't think it is the context that, that we've learned in church for so long that women have to be silent in the church, that they cannot lead in the church. Because if it's a gifts orientation within the church, then everybody's gift, our job as a church should be to maximize everybody's gift. That's it. Yeah? So if you, look at, if you look at Pastor Tracy and I in the church, last, last weekend we had Ron and Judy McIntosh in who are overseers, they're amazing people. If you, if you didn't check that out, uh, his message is still uh, um, up on the website that you can take a look at. And Judy had mentioned, we were, we were at our house and just in a conversation, and she, she said, listen, Pastor James, I, I don't know that I have ever seen co-pastors that, that work together as well as you and your wife do. And I was like, hey, man, could you say that again? I could take that, you know, a little bit of encouragement. I like that. But we don't even call each other co-pastors, but we are. We lead the church together. And actually, Tracy could lead the church by herself or I could lead the church by myself. But what we've found is we have different gifts inside of us. Like I can do all that Tracy does in the church. Tracy can do all that I do in the church. But 
There's some specific gifts that if we highlight them, we can lead the church better. So what we've done is, yeah. So what we've done is we've designed our roles a little bit differently. If you were to look at uh, Pastor Tracy's title at Grow Church, it would be lead pastor. If you were to look at my title, it would be executive pastor. Yeah, we co-pastor the church, but we want to define it well so that our staff knows where to go for what types of questions. So we're going to just expound on our strengths. This is, this is business principles 101, guys. Like if you're gifted in something, you're going to get somewhere with it. If you're not, you're not. Right? So I think this is all that we're, this is all that we're doing. We're, we're saying you can never be 100% at something that you're not gifted in. So like, let's look at the gift and let's raise that out of it. And, and it's not just Tracy and I, it's all of you. We're looking for gifts at Grow Church because when God sends you to the church, we're excited. He's brought something new to the church. The church is about to look different. It's about to get better. Why? Because you just showed up. That's what a gift-based church looks like. And it doesn't matter your gender. Whatever you show up with in your gifting, we're going to try and find it. And we're going to try and set you loose in what God wants you to do. Yeah? So that, that's what we do at Grow Church. So the next one is this. Like, focus on your strengths for maximum impact. That's what we're doing personally. That's what we want you to do because you can get to your maximum impact. Look at, look at this in Genesis 127. It says this, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. That's important. He created them. That would mean male and female, he created them. So wait, why, why do I go to this scripture? Because I think this, I actually think that you may need a male and a female together to truly see the full image of God. Huh. You thought you were all that, didn't you? <laughs> but we might need all of us to see the full image of God. Because God has characteristics that you don't have. Maybe your partner has those characteristics that you don't have. Maybe to see the full image of God, the closer you get to each other, the more you can see Jesus. I don't know. I'm just saying. <laughs> Genesis 2 calls the female a helper. And we all think, well, well, then she's there just to help me <laughs> get somewhere. But helper also can be defined as something that you don't have. Right? Like helpers have something that the other doesn't. So I could be a helper at some times because I might have some gifts that somebody else doesn't have. You could be a helper at different times. It's not gender specific. It's just, I could be a helper. I could be a blessing with my gifts. So I'm looking for my gifts. And also, ladies, you might want to mark this down because helper in the New Testament was referred to as the Holy Spirit. Come on. You just put that in your back pocket right there. Come on. Yeah, if you need it, you can use it. Yeah, I'll give that to you for free. You can use it if you need to. Let me, let me just go through a quick list here of notable women. This is not exhaustive, but it's notable women in the scriptures. Uh, Phoebe, or however you say that, was a deaconess. So she was a leader in the church, Romans 16. Another Romans 16, Priscilla and Agila. Priscilla was actually the leader. That's the female name because you've never seen that name before. Uh, Priscilla was the, the, the pastor or leader of the, the church at home. Romans 16 also shows us Mary worked hard preaching. She wasn't preaching to herself, I imagine. Tryphena and Tryphosa. Tryphena and Tryphosa, try that. That's a cool grow group right there. Um, they were workers in the Lord. Second John, the elect lady was running the church. Um, Judges 4, whoa, Old Testament? You gonna go Old Testament on me? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Deborah was a prophetess. Oh, what's a prophetess do? Um, prophetess, just like a prophet, hears from God and tells people what she heard. Sounds like a pastor to me. Doesn't it sound like a leader in the church to you? That's what it sounds like. So, I, I mean, I don't know why we have to minimize certain people and maximize others. I think the church was meant to just maximize everybody. Yeah. Exodus 15, Miriam spoke mightily the word of God, probably not just to herself. Acts 16, Lydia was the first convert in Europe. Oh, actually, if she was the first convert in Europe, huh, we're probably all in her lineage. Uh, at least our Christianity is. Um, Acts 1.14, this is interesting. The 120 disciples were made of men and women. You can look it up on your own, but it's true. 
Peter, he launches the church in Acts 2. Peter launches the church in Acts 2. You might remember the story. He's talking to, to everybody and he uses the prophet Joel from the Old Testament again. So this has always been the heart of God throughout the Old and the New. But he uses the, the, the words of the, the prophet Joel when he launches the church. Watch, watch these words from the, the prophet Joel. This is crazy. And, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Say that with me, all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams because they're sleeping all the time. Your young men, <laughs> that wasn't in the script, that was just me. Um, your, your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. This is during, yeah. He's looking at whatever gifts God sends, we're going to maximize them. That's what, that's what Peter's looking at. We're going to need you all. There's 50% men, 50% women, somewhat. That's the percentages. We're going to need to go with 100% to get this whole world saved. Let's go. Let's go, right? Come on. So we believe, we believe at Grow Church, we believe women have a place in leadership in the church. Yeah. But we also believe... If you're a man or woman, there is no lid on your potential in this house. There is no lid on your potential in this house. We will take you as far as you will let us take you within the, God, the gifts that God has put inside of you. We wanna see you maximized and not minimized. Can I get a better amen than that? Come on. So like the enemy, his intention is to marginalize everybody. What he does is he'll, he'll even use not just uh, like the topic of today, like your gender, he'll, he'll use your past. He'll use decisions that you made to marginalize you. He'll, he'll use scriptures like that to marginalize your church and say like, no, no, no. Like your gifts don't matter because you're a woman or because of your past looks like this or because you, you did this, like you can't ever get to where God has called you to go. And I would say to the enemy, I'm not listening anymore. I'm not listening to the tradition of man. I'm listening to the heart of Jesus. Can you say that with me? I'm listening to the heart of Jesus. Come on, let's, let's listen for the heart of Jesus. God shows up at Grow Church. God shows up in worship for every single person that will call on his name. I don't know a Sunday that we've gone through that worship hasn't shown us a, a healing of some sort. It could be a healing physically. It could be emotionally or, or inside, whatever, whatever it is. We get testimonies every single week of God showing up at Grow Church. That's because, yeah, amen. That's because we're gonna listen for the heart of Jesus and not just the tradition of men. Would you listen to one thing though? Jesus loves you. He wants to maximize you. Would you do this with me this morning? Would you bow your heads? close your eyes just for a second. I want to speak directly to any of you that feel like you've been marginalized. Now, this isn't just women or just men. This is anybody that feels like, man, I, I've been held back in my life. I've been held back. I, I didn't even know that Jesus could love me this much. I didn't know that Jesus could accept me because of my past or the decisions that I've made. So if you're in this place and you have never met Jesus, today's a perfect opportunity to meet Jesus. He's waiting for your choice to invite him in. And when you do that, your life will never be the same. I wanna do this just real quick as every head's bowed, every eye's closed, nobody's looking around. This is just between you and Jesus. I want you, if you're here and have never met Jesus, I want you to take a bold step and just lift up your hand and say, I want you in my heart, Jesus. I see that hand, awesome. Just another moment, if that's you, and you have never met Jesus and you wanna meet Jesus, you can put your hands back down. Or if you're in this place and you've known Jesus, but you feel like the enemy's had his way with you and you feel so far from God that you're like, I just need to rededicate my life to Jesus. If that's you today and you're like, I, I just need to, I, I need to rededicate myself to him because today can be a turning, a pivot point in your life. 
If that's you, I want you to raise your hand today and just say, between you and Jesus, that's me. I see those hands, awesome. More importantly, Jesus sees those hands, awesome, awesome. You can put them right back down. Let's say this prayer all together, if you'd repeat this after me. Dear Jesus, I accept you into my heart. Today is a pivot point. You are my savior. I repent of my sins and I'm never going back. In Jesus' name, amen. God, I just wanna pray over your people today, those that are rededicating their lives even, God. I thank you for stepping into their lives in the way that only you know how to do. God, I thank you for showing up and showing off amazing things, even today, this afternoon, God, in their lives. I thank you for uh, stepping into whatever areas that they need you to step into, God, because they have made a decision today to follow you closely. I, I pray that they would hear your voice today, God, in any decision that they need to make. In Jesus' name, and everyone said... Amen. Hey, can we give God some praise this morning?